Let me tell you, as one tasked with the privilege and the responsibility to preach, to bring to our gathering, to our community, a word that uh, explores that intersection of what God is saying and doing to us through Scripture And what's going on in the world, in our lives, in our community, in our town, in our nation. As it's time to explore where God is shaping and saying to us. As one tasked with that great privilege of preaching. The fact that Jesus chooses a sermon for his inaugural address to, of the world-changing movement is both inspiring and terrifying. Jesus could have started in any way he chose. He could have started with a cute little anecdote, a joke to cut the ice. He could have started by grabbing a baby to kiss and hold up and for this, the, the photo op. He could have started in so many ways. And instead, here in his first public teaching, he chooses a sermon. So far in Matthew, we've heard of Jesus' birth story. We've heard as he grew up a couple years and the Magi showed up and then immediately he had to run. He was a refugee down to Egypt. He and his family on the run because of state-sponsored terror. You remember the soldiers that came into Bethlehem to kill all the babies. And then finally, after living there for a couple years, hearing in a dream that it's okay to come back, Jesus has returned and grown. And now, as an adult, he's stepping into public life. And he does so with John. First thing is to get in the water with John and be baptized and then sent immediately out into the wilderness to wrestle and come to terms with the devil, to be tempted there in the wilderness. And now Jesus has come back home. He's come back into his own territory, into Galilee, that sort of uh, uh, rural area that he grew up in and lived in. He's gone from town to town, and the crowds have been noticing. Crowds of, of followers and supporters gathering around him bigger each time because Jesus is doing and saying the things that they most need and want to hear. He's healing helping. He's casting out demons, and the crowds have grown. The word spreading from village to village, town to town, until finally today, the crowds have grown so big that Jesus has to climb up the mountain. And there, up on the, perched on the slopes of this mountain, Jesus sits down to preach. I've always liked that idea that you sit down to preach. I think we should do that. So I'll sit, you stand, and we'll just keep going. How's that? No? Jesus sits down like all the rabbis would, that they, in his, his way to teach and to preach, and gathered there around him, in a, gathered in a cluster around him, are his disciples. He gathers those who have committed themselves to learning from Jesus how to live. For that's what it means to be a disciple. They have left nets and family and jobs and dreams They've to follow Jesus and learn how to live because they believe he has life to convey and to share. And so these are not the hangers-on. And these are not the casually interested. These are those who've made that commitment to learn from him how to work and to live and to walk in the world, to learn from him what life looks like. And it's to them, to his disciples, that Jesus turns. And he opens his mouth and he begins to preach. And he says, blessed are the, and we know how this goes, right? We know what it means to be blessed in this world. It gets rubbed in our faces every time we turn on that TV in the newspaper. We know how this goes. Blessed are the rich. 
Because they're the ones that have enough that they don't have to worry ever again. But they are the ones that can purchase power and gain a hearing. Blessed are the rich. That's clear. We know how this works. Blessed are the entertainers. They live lives of glamour and beauty. They work hard, yes, but is that really working? And they're in the news all the time, so they must be blessed. Blessed are the entertainers. We know how this goes. Blessed are the young, because they're the only ones that can fit into that size negative two outfits that they keep shoving mannequins in. They are the only ones who don't need those creams and salves and lifts and tucks and all those things that keep shoving at us that try to sh- convince us that we are not growing into what God intended and that's to be beautiful in our wisdom. Blessed are the young. It must be. Because we're told we're supposed to hold on to that. We know how this goes, don't we? It gets rubbed in our faces every time we open a newspaper or turn on the TV. Every time we walk into a store, we know what it means to be blessed. We know what it means to have made it in this world. Blessed are the politicians, for they can do whatever they want. And they can reshape things according to whim and according to their will. They are obviously the blessed because they have power. Blessed are the... We know how this works. We know how this world works, don't we? And so Jesus begins and he says, Blessed are the... And it doesn't look anything like our world. It doesn't look anything like reality that we live in, does it? It doesn't look anything like the world we inhabit and that we encounter every day. It doesn't look anything like what we know. And what are we to do with that? What do we do? Is Jesus lying? Is, Jesus, is this just foolishness? Is this nothing more than made-up alternative facts? Is this nothing more than a dream that does no landing in reality? And what can it possibly mean for us in this day of our Lord 2017 in Valparaiso, Indiana, the United States of America? When Jesus is so clearly describing something that is not the world we live in. What do we do with these Beatitudes? One of the things I discovered this week as one tasked with that great privilege and responsibility of exploring together What is it that God is saying to us here in and through this place, through these scriptures in our lives and in our worlds? As we, I dove into these beatitudes head first, what I learned is that there's too much here. Line after line of Jesus proclaiming blessing, there's too much here. Each of these deserves a sermon series itself. Each of these deserves several books, and I'm sure there are shelves out there full of them that explore what these mean and what Jesus means with these. There's too much here. And that's what the feeling is. As Jesus begins, instead of with a cute anecdote, instead of with the cute baby, Instead of with bombast or shaming us or with anything else, Jesus instead speaks with authority and says, this is how it is. And there's only one way that that can possibly be true. There's only one way that these blessings can possibly be true, and that's if God is active in history and the world today. 
if God is active in history and our world today. That's the only way that can be true. And as Jesus goes through, blessed are the poor in spirit. That can only be true if it's God that is saying it. Blessed are the meek. Those who choose to not pursue their own rights. Blessed are the peacemakers. There's a wonderful picture I found this week from, uh, from Kiev in the Ukraine. When Russia was invading and there were riots there in the city, you have riot police over on this side and you have a crowd over here and both sides are clearly wanting to hurt each other and in the middle stand the Orthodox priests in full vestments with their, uh, with their stoles holding their holy icons, holding their crosses, standing there in between to our armed crowds. This is dangerous work to be a peacemaker. And as we hear Jesus preach, as we hear Jesus proclaim blessing and teach us how to recognize it, we start to notice something, don't we? We start to notice that this looks a lot like Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He was a refugee child. He lived there in tiny rural villages in, the, in Palestine. He was homeless. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are, are you when people revile you. We notice this looks like Jesus and line after line it starts to describe this one that we have fallen for. The one we've pledged ourselves to. To learn how to live. We discover that Jesus describing these beatitudes is describing himself on the cross. For that is where we see the heart of God most clearly. Jesus here, as we go through, we realize, looks more and more. And by the time we get to the end, and he turns to us, blessed are you. When people revile you and persecute you and slander you on account of my name, blessed are you. By that time, we are already in, aren't we? This is our Jesus that we've pledged ourselves to, that we follow and are learning and being shaped by to know how to live in this world. He's describing the heart of God that we see on that cross. Jesus, who takes in all the vulnerabilities of this world, all of the poor and the meek and the peacemakers, all those who are vulnerable in this world, and embraces them all on that cross. We realize Jesus is talking about himself. And that is blessing. For God is loose in the world. And Jesus here is showing us how God sees us. And God is so different than us. God is nothing like us. God doesn't see us or this world in any of the ways we expect. All of this is upside down. And as Archbishop Tesman Tutu puts it in his impish, wonderful way, he says, um, when we get to heaven, we may be surprised by who's there. God has a notorious soft spot for sinners. He has very low standards. That's how Desmond Tutu puts it. But Jesus here is describing to us how God sees us and God's view of the world. And it is so different than what we're used to seeing. But maybe that's the point. Because together, we've come here to learn from Jesus how to be in the world. Together, 
We've come here to learn from Jesus how to live. We've come here because Jesus offers a life we've not been able to find any place else. Together, we've come here so that we can be shaped to be his body in the world, and his body looks like this. And since Christianity is nothing more and nothing less than a, re- than a, uh, than a relationship with Jesus, this is an invitation to walk in the world with Jesus and see each other and this world through God's eyes that proclaim blessing everywhere the world overlooks. This is an invitation to look around because we know God is up to something in this world. Jesus has invited us into his kingdom, which is both to come and already here. And we are invited to be with him. So the invitation today is to let these beatitudes be a lens, to see the world the way Jesus does to see the vulnerable, broken places where terrible things happen in this world and to allow ourselves to be heartsick by it. To be with Jesus, with God, looking hard at the broken places and where people get hurt, and whether in our courts or in our, our airports or wherever it is, to recognize those places where people, this world is not as God intends and to be heartbroken with God. For me, I am heartbroken this morning that the Bible tells us very clearly that God entrusts refugees into our care, and my nation of immigrants has decided to leave there are most of refugees, almost 50% of them are children. My nation of immigrants has decided to leave them and block them and allow them to watch up on the beach. For me, that is a heartbreak. For you, it may be something different. But what matters is that we are invited to recognize the broken and fallenness of this world and be heartbroken by it. For that is where Jesus' heart is. And we are invited to follow him there. For Jesus is always on the other side of every line we draw in the sand. So what are we to do with these Beatitudes? It's an invitation an invitation to recognize God's blessing by where God is at work. It is an invitation to see the truth of this world the way Jesus sees it, and then to take that truth to the cross where we see God's heart. These Beatitudes are an invitation to walk with Jesus.